News of the Times, Wicked Wednesdays, Firsts in Murder. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at two cases of firsts in murder. These are famous cases where the method of murder was considered new or a first. Our first case comes from Paris in 1823. Newly graduated Dr. Edmi Castaigne has completely fallen for a widow, three children, and expensive tastes. As previous poor financial decisions come back to haunt him, and with utter financial ruin facing him, Castaigne looks to his rather well off friends as a murderer, murderous way out of his predicament with the help of morphine. In our second case, from London in 1886, Adelaide Bartlett is in a strange type of love triangle with the blessing of her husband, who encourages her relationship with the pastor. Over time, Adelaide's affections turn more strongly to the pastor, as she now nurses her now unwell husband with chloroform. To this day, no one knows how she did it. Morphine and chloroform, two methods of murder that were unique at the time, is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Historically, this case from 1823 is considered the first case where morphine was used to murder. Much of what we know about this case comes from a book of remarkable criminals by H. B. Irving in 1918. Background. Edme Castain, born at Alacon in 1796, was the youngest of three sons of an inspector general in the Department of Woods and Forests. Young Edme decided to enter the medical profession and at the age of 19 commenced his studies at the School of Medicine in Paris. For two years he worked hard and well, living with, within the modest allowance made him by his father. Contemporary accounts paint a portrait of Edme as an attractive figure possessing a fine elongated face adorned with regular features, his high forehead, fair hair elegantly brushed back, and the presence of a large, impressive side whiskers added to his distinctive appearance. Observers noted that he often projected an air more akin to a priest than a doctor. His eyes frequently downcast, and his quiet, unassuming demeanour conveyed an impression of boundless patience and humility. Two events were to change the course of his life. In 1818, Castaigne allowed himself to be used as a guarantor of a loan to a friend for 600 francs, with the payment date set for two years hence. The second event was Castaigne's falling for utterly and completely a widow with three children. Reports vary as to whether her now deceased husband was a judge or a doctor, but what is quite clear is her expectation of a certain level of financial and social standing. In 1821, Castaigne became a, a duly qualified doctor, and by that time, had added to the responsibilities of his mistress and himself by becoming the father of two children with his adored mistress. The lady was difficult, and Castaigne found it challenging to combine his work with a due regard to her claims on his society. Nor was work plentiful or lucrative. Simultaneously, his friend could not possibly pay the now outstanding debt of 600 francs, placing 
that financial burden squarely on Castain. Castain did everything he could to find the money. His father, displeased with his son's conduct, would do nothing to help him. His adored mistress, the widow, now, with two additional children by Castain, made it an expensive household of five. Pressures on Castain were reaching boiling point, when, all of a sudden, in October of 1822, Castain mysteriously became the possessor of 100,000 francs. The Ballet Brothers. Among the friends of Castaigne were two young men of about his own age, Auguste and Hippolyte Ballet. Both brothers had each been left 260,000 francs upon the death of their parents. Dr. Castaigne became the fast friend of Hippolyte Ballet, a man described as suffering weak health. Apart from his personal liking for Castain, he was a source of comfort to Hippolyta in his critical state of health. To have as his friend one whose medical knowledge was always at his service. The Crime About in the middle of August 1822, Hippolyta, on the advice of his doctors, went on a trip to take the waters. There... Castain paid him frequent visits. Hippolyta returned to Paris on September the 22nd and seemed to have benefited greatly by the cure. On Tuesday, October the 1st, Hippolyta visited his sister and her husband. He seemed relatively well. He told them he was having leeches applied to him by his friend Castain the following day. Wednesday followed where he was visited by his sister who commented how well he seemed. On the Thursday, after a night disturbed by severe attacks of vomiting, Hippolyta's condition seemed serious. Visitors found that he had taken to bed with his face swollen and his eyes red. His sister called in the evening but was not allowed to see him. The servants told her that her brother was a little better but resting, and that he did not wish to be disturbed. They said that Dr. Castin had been with him all day. On Friday, Castain himself called on the sister and told her that Hippolyta had passed a shockingly bad night. The sister insisting on going to nurse her brother herself, but Castain refused positively to let her see him. The sight of her, he said, would be too agitating to the patient. At ten o'clock, the sister received a message that Hippolyta was dying and that his brother, Auguste, had been sent for. The sister was prostrated with grief. Upon going to his house, she found Castain, who said that the death agony of his friend was so dreadful that he had not the strength to remain in the room with the dying man. Another doctor was sent for, but at ten o'clock the following morning, after protracted suffering, Hippolyta Ballet passed away. The Postmortem a post-mortem was held on his body. It was made by doctors Selaglas and Cassin. Their conclusion stated that death was due to pleurisy aggravated by consumption. A sad death, but unremarkable according to the combined report of Cassin and Dr. Segala. Hippolyta had died leaving a fortune of some 240,000 francs. Before his death, he had spoken to a clerk of his father's, expressing his concern at the speed with which his brother Auguste was spending his own inheritance. With no will found, Hippolyta was presumed to have died intestate. 
His fortune was divided, three quarters of it going to his brother, August, and the remaining quarter to his sister. The Odd Request On the day of his brother's death, Auguste Ballet wrote from his brother's house to the financial holder of their funds, stating, With great grief, I have to tell you that I have just lost my brother. I write at the same time to say that I must have 100,000 francs today if possible. I have the greatest need of it. Destroy my letter and reply at once. Stocks were sold and the sum of 100,000 francs raised. Upon receipt of the money, Auguste was seen to hand over the sum to Castin and say, There are the 100,000 francs. Stories were told as to the purpose of this required urgent sum of 100,000 francs. We do know that on October the 10th, 1822, Castaigne gave a stockbroker a sum of 66,000 francs to invest in securities, and on the 11th of the same month, he lent his mother 30,000 francs, and on the 14th, he gave his mistress 4,000 francs. Purchase. Castan had enriched himself considerably by the opportune death of his friend Hippolyta. It might be made a matter of unfriendly comment that, on the first day of May preceding that sad event, Castan had purchased ten grains of acetate of morphia from a chemist in Paris, and on September the 18th, less than a month before Hippolyta's death, he had purchased another ten grains of acetate of morphia from the same chemist. The subject of poisons had always been a favourite branch of Castaigne's medical studies, especially vegetable poisons. Morphia is a vegetable poison. Auguste Ballet. Were the two Auguste and Castaigne now tied as partners in a crime to the murder of Auguste's brother Hippolyta? We can only surmise. Whatever the motive, from fear or gratitude, Auguste Ballet was persuaded to make a will, leaving Dr. Edmi Samuel Castaigne the whole of his fortune, subject to a few trifling legacies. However, it was noted that Auguste's feeling towards his sole legatee and former friend, Castaigne, were no longer cordial. To one or two of his friends he expressed his growing distaste for Castaigne's society. Dr. Castaigne can hardly have failed to observe this change. Additionally, Auguste was known to be reckless and extravagant with his money. Castaigne learned that Auguste had taken another 100,000 francs out of his securities and that he kept the money locked up in a drawer. Castaigne could see Auguste's fortune being dissipated by extravagance. If Auguste revoked his will, Castaigne stood to lose heavily. Additionally, Auguste had fallen in love with a new mistress who he began to entertain expensively. Even if Auguste did not change his mind and leave his money to Castaigne, there might very soon be no money to leave. Auguste's Will At the end of May, Castaigne consulted a friend of his who was a notary clerk to check on the hypothetical legitimacy of a will made where the beneficiary was the medical practitioner caring for the patient. His friend confirmed that such a will would be considered legal. On May the 29th, Castaigne sent the same friend a copy of the will of his friend Auguste. The will made Castaigne the sole legatee. The Trip on the same day that the will was deposited with his friend, Castain and Auguste Ballet started together on a little two-day's trip to the country. 
To his friends, Auguste seemed in the best of health and spirits, so much so that his housekeeper remarked as he left how well he was looking, and Castin echoed her remark, saying that he looked like a prince. After seeing the sights and returning back to the inn, Castain ordered some warmed wine to be sent up to the bedroom, which was taken up by one of the maidservants. Two glasses were mixed with lemon and sugar, which Castain had brought with him. Both the young men drank the beverage. Auguste complained that it was sour, and thought that he had put too much lemon in it. He gave his glass to the servant to taste who also found the drink sour. Auguste spent a bad night, suffering from internal pains, and in the morning his legs were so swollen that he could not put on his boots. The Chemist Castain got up at four o'clock that morning and asked one of the servants to let him out. Two hours later he drove up in a cabriolet to the door of a chemist in Paris and asked for twelve grains of tartar emetic, which he wanted to mix in a wash according to a prescription of Dr. Castin. But he did not tell the chemist that he was Dr. Castin himself. An hour later, Castin arrived at the shop of another chemist, Chevalier, with whom he had already some acquaintance. He had bought acetate of morphia from him, from him some months before, and had discussed with him the effect of vegetable poison. On this particular morning, he bought of his assistant thirty-six grains of acetate of morphia, paying, as a medical man, three francs fifty centimes for it, instead of the usual price of four francs. Later in the morning, Castain returned to the inn and said that he had been out for a long walk. He found Auguste ill in bed. Castain asked for some cold milk, which was taken up to the bedroom by one of the servants. Shortly after this, Castain went out again. During his absence, Auguste was seized with violent pains and sickness. When Castain returned, he found his friend in the care of the people of the hotel. He told them to throw away the matter that had been vomited, as the smell was offensive. Castain proposed to send for a doctor from Paris, but Auguste insisted that a local doctor should be called in at once. The doctor arrived at the hotel at about eleven o'clock, before Seeing the patient, Castain told the doctor that he believed him to be suffering from cholera. The doctor asked to see the matter vomited, but was told that it had been thrown away. He prescribed a careful diet, lemonade, and a soothing draught. In the afternoon, Ballet was much better. He said that he would be quite well if he could get some sleep, and expressed a wish to return to Paris. The doctor dissuaded him from this and left, saying that he would come again in the evening. At about eleven o'clock that night, Castin, in the presence of others, gave the sick man a spoonful of the draught prescribed by the doctor. Four or five minutes later, Auguste was seized with terrible convulsions, followed by unconsciousness. The doctor was sent for. He found Ballet lying on his back unconscious, his throat strained, his mouth shut, and his eyes fixed. The pulse was weak, his body covered with cold sweat, and every now and then he was seized with a strong convulsion. The doctor asked Castain the cause of the sudden change in Ballet's condition. Castain replied, that it had commenced shortly after he had taken a spoonful of the draught which the doctor had prescribed for him. The doctor bled the patient and applied twenty leeches. At about six, Ballet was sinking, 
and Castaigne appeared to be greatly upset. He told the doctor what an unhappy coincidence it was that he should have been present at the deathbeds of both Hippolyta and his brother Auguste, and that the position was the more distressing for him as he was the sole heir to Auguste's fortune. At about midday, on Sunday, June the 1st, Auguste Ballet died. The Postmortem Monday, June the 2nd, was the day fixed for the postmortem. It was performed in the hotel at St. Cloud. Castaigne was still in the hotel under provisional arrest. While the postmortem was going on, his agitation was extreme. He kept opening the door of the room in which he was confined to t hear, if possible, news of the result. The medical men declared death to be due to an inflammation of the stomach, which could be attributed to natural causes, that the inflammation had subsided and that it had been succeeded by cerebral inflammation, which frequently follows inflammation of the stomach and may have been aggravated, in this case, by exposure to the sun or by overindulgence of any kind. Castan was in the clear, and there was no suspicion of the trial of Dr. Castain. Despite the findings of the post-mortem, Castain was not released. Conversely, he was placed under stricter arrest and taken to Paris where an investigation commenced, lasting five months. The trial of Castaigne commenced before the Paris Assize Court on November the 10th, 1823. He was charged with the murder of Hippolyta Ballet, the destruction of a document containing the final dispositions of Hippolyta's property, and with the murder of Auguste Ballet. The three charges were to be tried simultaneously. From minute investigations, the story unfolded of the events leading up to the death of the both brothers. The case was purely circumstantial. There was the evidence within letters, the question of a mentioned will that had disappeared, the chemical purchases of, of Gastein, and his undoubted expertise in the subject of plant-based poisons, the, the mystery money placed in his account, and Auguste's last will with Castaigne named a sole legatee, a copy of which had been held with his friend on the very day of the trip between Auguste and Castaigne that ended in his untimely death. The case was purely circumstantial. The trial was unrelenting and unforgiving. It lasted eight days. It was only at midday on the sixth day that the evidence was concluded. Not only was Castaigne compelled to submit to a long interrogatory by the president, but after each witness had given his or her evidence, the prisoner was called on to refute or explain any points unfavourable to him. This he did briefly, with varying success, as the trial went on with increasing embarrassment. Regarding the lack of evidence of poison in the body, the prosecutor sarcastically stated to potential poisoners, bunglers that you are, don't use arsenic or any mineral poison. They leave traces. You will be found out. Use vegetable poisons. Poison your fathers. Poison your mothers. Poison all of your families, and their inheritance will be yours. Fear nothing. You will go unpunished. You have committed murder by poisoning, it is true. But the corpus delicti will not be there because it can't be there. It was nine o'clock at night when the jury retired to consider their verdict. They returned into court after two hours' deliberation. They found the prisoner not guilty of the murder of 
Hippolyta Ballet, guilty of destroying his will and guilty by seven votes to five of the murder of Auguste Ballet. Castaigne was not ashamed to appeal to the court of cassation for a revision of his trial, but on December the 4th, his appeal was rejected. Two days later, he was executed. Castaigne had attempted suicide by means of poison, which one of his friends had brought to him in prison, concealed inside a watch. His courage failed him at the last, and he met his death in a state of collapse. This sad case from France in 1822 is considered one of the first cases of using morphine to murder. Our second case of first is the strange case of death by chloroform. The characters of the mystery. Adelaine Bartlett. Adelaine, who changed her name from Blanche upon her marriage to her English husband, was born in France in 1855. Young and exceptionally beautiful, she married successful businessman, grocer, Thomas Edwin Bartlett, in 1875 when she was 19 years old. They had met when she was 16, but had waited to marry until she reached age. Thomas Edwin Bartlett, Adelaide's husband, known as Edwin. He married Adelaide when he was 30 years of age, some 10 to 11 years older than Adelaide. Reports regarding his health differ. His father claimed that Edwin was never ill and enjoyed robust health. Adelaide reported that Edwin had a prolonged illness, possibly suffering from tapeworms. Certainly, near his end, Edwin complained of his teeth, having eleven of them removed. The Reverend George Dyson The Reverend Mr. Dyson had met the Bartlett's approximately one year before as part of his congregation, when he was the Wesleyan minister at Merton, where Adelaide and Edwin had lived before moving to Pimlico. The Relationship There were two differing stories told of the marriage relationship between Edwin and Adelaide. According to Adelaide, and supported by Reverend Dyson, the Bartlett's particular friend, the Bartlett's relationship was based on a purely platonic affiliation. No intimacy was to take place between them. Instead, Edwin was happy to encourage other men to pay their attentions to his beautiful wife, with special encouragement given to the Reverend George Dyson. Adelaide's own court testimony stated, from the Penny Illustrated paper, the 25th of February, 1886, Mrs. Bartlett's Strange Ideas. At the age of 16, Mrs. Bartlett was selected by him, Edwin Bartlett, as a life companion, for whom no feeling nearer than that of friendship should be entertained. The marriage contract was that they should live together as loving friends and not enter into any more intimate relations. After about six years, however, one child was born which died at its birth. Afterwards, they lived together as before. Mr. Bartlett encouraged her to pursue studies of various kinds, and this she did to please him. He liked to surround her with male acquaintances and enjoy their attentions to her. Mrs. Bartlett stated that during the last few months, her husband had spoken occasionally to her in a way to imply that his life would not be a long one, and he began to encourage and promote an affection more than platonic, but not criminal, between herself and a friend of his own, the Reverend George Dyson, who was engaged to teach her Greek 
or some kindred subject. In the exact words of his wife, he had given me to Mr. Dyson. Mrs. Bartlett told her husband Edwin a short time before he died that she felt it to be her duty to her womanhood and the man to whom she was practically affianced, Mr. Reverend Dyson, at her husband's wish, to resist all further solicitations from her husband and from any other admirers that he, Edwin, urged upon her. In other words, she would remain strictly in relations with George Dyson. This explanation of her relationship with her now dead husband Edwin was countered by Edwin's father. It should be noted in advance that Edwin's father notoriously intensely disliked Adelaide. There were some vague accusations from him of her having slept with Edwin's brother, but no proof was given to support this statement. However, his dislike for Adelaide was well known. He had not attended their wedding. From the Penny Illustrated, the 27th of February, 1886, Evidence of Mr. Bartlett's Father Mr. Bartlett's evidence was of interest. From him came many details of the early married life of the prisoner. He told how, before she was nineteen years of age, the Bartlett family became acquainted with her and knew her as Blanche. How she and his son were married at the parish church in Croydon in April in 1875, and how the deceased man, Edwin, stuck to his business and throve living all the while with his wife, Adelaide, so far as he could be seen as married people usually live. With regard to the final illness during which he went to see his son six times, but was thrice refused admission to the room, he said his son seemed to be under the influence of a narcotic and was not so sharp and impressive as he usually was. Mr. Baxter, the next witness, stated in cross-examination to Mr. Clark that his deceased partner, Edwin, made a profit of £300 a year out of the business, worth approximately £50,000 in 2023. The landlord of the apartments in which Mr. Bartlett died was the first witness who could speak about the Reverend Mr. Dyson. The deceased father admitted that he knew nothing personally about him. So, what of the third party in this picture? The especial friend of the Bartlett's, and in particular, Adelaide Bartlett, the Reverend Mr. George Dyson. From the Penny Illustrated paper, the 20th of February, 1886, Mr. Dyson's Evidence. He said that he was a Wesleyan minister living at Putney and made the acquaintance of Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett about a year ago at Merton, at the time they were members of his congregation, when he had charge of the Wesleyan chapel at Merton. They grew intimate. Mrs. Bartlett confided to him that her husband suffered from an internal complaint for which she was treating him herself, and that she was in the habit of giving him chloroform to soothe him. He became very friendly with them and visited them often, and eventually Mr. Bartlett asked him to assist his wife in her studies. In December he was made executor to Mr. Bartlett, who told him that he had left his property to his wife and put him down in his will. The Bartlett's went to live at Dover for a month, where the witness also visited them. On the return they took apartments in Claverton Street, Pimlico, where the Reverend Dyson continued to visit them, Mr. Bartlett having taken a railway season ticket for him. Mr. Bartlett then complained of failing health, but the Reverend Dyson continued his visits regularly up till the time that the deceased was attended by Dr. Leach, when he did not call so frequently. 
The Reverend Dyson saw Mr. Bartlett on Boxing Day on the 26th of December and on the following Sunday and again on December the 29th. At the time of his death, Edwin was 40 years old. His health was described by medical professionals as remarkably good until shortly before Christmas when he became unwell. There were references to mercurial or lead poisoning and indeed these metals were found in his body during the autopsy but were not suspected to be the cause of death. Several days before Edwin's death on the 31st of December 1885, Edwin had some medical difficulties. Several references are made to his rotting teeth. For our listeners, we now know that continued use of chloroform can have a significant softening of tooth enamel and dentine, leading to rotten teeth. We know there were references to his having worms which were being treated by Adelaide. There are references to his inability to sleep, which was also treated by Adelaide through the use of chloroform, according to Adelaide, to ease him. And there were references to overall weakness, a narcotic drug look and general illness. His father states that Edwin had told him he was suffering from mercurial poisoning, but this was not substantiated. The Chloroform Prior to the events that unfolded on the 31st of December, Mrs. Bartlett had especially requested that the Reverend Dyson purchase a large bottle of chloroform for her. She said she required a large bottle of chloroform as it evaporated so quickly. She desired the chloroform to help Edwin as it helped to quieten him. Chloroform at this time was a controlled substance and could not be had in large quantities. The Reverend Dyson acceded to her request and went to several chemists' shops to accrue the requested amount of chloroform for Adelaide. This was handed to Adelaide a few days before Edwin's death. From the Penny Illustrated Paper, the 20th of February, 1886, Reverend Dyson Testimony On the Sunday night, as he was leaving, Mrs. Bartlett went out with letters to post and asked him if he could get some chloroform for her, as she was in the habit of using it externally to quiet her husband. She said that as the chloroform evaporated quickly, she should like to have a medium glass bottle full of it. The Reverend Mr. Dyson described his purchase of the chloroform at various shops in Putney and Wimbledon, at each of which he implied the stuff was wanted for some other purpose. He stated, On the Tuesday I took the bottle to Mrs. Bartlett and gave it to her when we went out for a walk. Mr. Bartlett went out for a drive, and I took Mrs. Bartlett out for a walk. She thanked me for the bottle and said that that would do. Reverend Dyson stated that on Sunday, after the post-mortem examination of the deceased, he threw away on Wandsworth Common the bottles in which he bought the chloroform for Mrs. Bartlett. Dyson continued, it was on Sunday the 27th of December that she, Adelaide, asked him to get her some chloroform and that Annie Walker had brought some before. Adelaide said she wanted it to soothe her husband and give him sleep, and she asked if I could get some for her. I said I would, and I did. She said she wanted it for external use. The crime took place on the 31st of December, 1885, the landlord was made aware of Edwin's death at 4 a.m. on the 1st of January, 1886. From the Penny Illustrated Paper, the 20th of February, 1886, the deceased, Mr. Bartlett, 
was a well-to-do young grocer and provision dealer, having shops at Hearn Hill and other places, and he died under somewhat peculiar and suspicious circumstances at number 85 Claverton Street in Pimlico, where Mrs. Bartlett and the deceased resided up to the time of his death, which took place early on the morning of New Year's Day. On the day preceding his death he had eleven teeth extracted, and upon returning home went to bed, apparently in his usual state of health. He retired to rest shortly after reaching home, and Mrs. Bartlett sleeping by his bedside with her arm around his foot. Nothing more is known of him until New Year's morning, when, according to the statement of the female prisoner, she awoke suddenly and found the deceased lying on his back. Being alarmed at his condition, she applied some brandy to his chest, but failing to put animation in him, she sent for Dr. Leach, who, upon his arrival shortly after four o'clock in the morning, pronounced life to be extinct. Suspicion being aroused as to the cause of his death, a post-mortem examination of the body of the deceased showed that he had met his death by some poisonous matter. It was admitted by the prisoner, Dyson, that he purchased chloroform by making inaccurate representations at different chemist shops at Putney and elsewhere, which he gave to the female prisoner, and he readily owned that he had thrown one bottle away. The death of Mr. Bartlett impelled Mrs. Bartlett to call the landlord Mr. Frederick Thomas Doggett who said in court that on the January the 1st Mrs. Bartlett called him about four in the morning and said, Come down, will you? I believe Mr. Bartlett is dead. He had never spoken to Mrs. Bartlett before. Mr. Doggett went downstairs directly. It was ten minutes past four when he went into the drawing-room and the deceased was lying on a bed between the window and the fireplace. The pursuance of Edwin's death came from his father, who outlined several suspicious circumstances which made him request a post-mortem. Edwin's father's testimony outlined the illness and Edwin's ensuing death. From the Penny Illustrated paper, the 27th of February, 1886, The Pimlico Mystery, the father of Thomas Edwin Bartlett, Generally speaking, my son's health was very good up to the month of October last. I only knew him to be ill about four or five years ago. Never saw Mr. Dyson before my son took the house in Pimlico, and about twenty-two days before my son's death I heard from Mr. Baxter that my son was ill. I went to Pimlico to see him. I saw him in the front drawing-room. He was laying on a sort of couch and was partially undressed. It was in the afternoon. Mrs. Bartlett, Adelaide, was there. My son said, The doctor has told me I am poisoned with mercury. I remained there a little under two hours on that occasion. My son did not tell me how he was suffering, but he appeared to be dazed. I called after that, I believe, my appointment with Mrs. Bartlett. I called again the next Sunday at about seven o'clock. I knocked on the door, and a servant spoke to me. I did not see my son. I was told he was too ill. I did not see Mrs. Bartlett. She sent down word that she was too busy to see me. The name of the servant was Alice. My next call was about a Wednesday after. I did not then see my son. I saw Mrs. Bartlett. She said, How are you, dear? And I replied, Pretty well. Is my son with the doctor? She said, Yes. The conversation was downstairs in the smoking room. I asked her who the doctor was, and she replied, The doctor up the street. I was told that my son 
was too ill to see me. I had a half an hour's conversation with Mrs. Bartlett. I received a letter from Mrs. Bartlett by post the Monday before my son's death. The postmark is December the 28th, 1885. The letter was read by the chief clerk as follows. Dear Mr. Bartlett, I hear you are a little disturbed because Edwin has been too ill to see you. I wish, if possible, to be friends with you, but you must place yourself on the same footing as other people. That is to say, you are welcome here when I invite you and at no other time. You seem to forget that I have not been to bed for thirteen days and am consequently too tired to talk to visitors. I am sorry to speak so plainly to you, but I wish you distinctly to understand that I have neither forgiven nor forgotten the past. Edwin will be pleased to see you on Monday evening, any time after six. Yours sincerely, Adelaide Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett continued, There was some years' prejudice between me and Mrs. Bartlett in the trust. Nothing to do with me, more to do with my son than me. That unpleasantness had nothing to do with the present case. I went on the Monday to see my son in the evening at half-past six. I saw him in the front drawing-room, where he was lying in a dressing-gown on the little iron bedstead. I remained two hours and a half, Mrs. Bartlett being in the room all the time. My son said he was a good deal better and should soon be in business again. On this occasion, when I was with him for two hours, my son said, I have a quantity of worms crawling about me, and Mrs. Bartlett said, We call them snakes. I said, It is strange, and my son said, It's a good thing Adelaide has had to do with the dogs. They bred St. Bernard's, for she understands the worms. He added, Dr. Leach had given me some croton oil. I do not recollect anything else said about his illness or what it was. I did not see him drink anything. He was very abstemious. In the course of the interview he got up and walked about the room and seemed quite strong. He spoke something about having his teeth out, just in the ordinary course. I did not recollect anything else. I wished him goodbye and left. The next thing I heard about my son was from Mr. Baxter, that he was dead about eleven o'clock on the morning of January the 1st. I went in a cab to Claverton Street and saw Mrs. Bartlett down in the smoking room. She said, Edwin is dead. Mrs. Matthews was present at the time, and I believe Mr. Dyson. I don't know whether I had seen Mr. Dyson before, but I think he was introduced to me on this occasion. I went upstairs after a time. I got riled having to wait in the smoking room and not being allowed to go to see him. After a long conversation between Mrs. Bartlett and Mr. Dyson, whispered in the corner, I went up. On going out of the room, she placed her arms around my neck and said, My dear father, don't fret. It shall make no odds to you. I will see you never want. It shall be just the same as if Edwin was alive. I went into the front drawing room, leaned over him, and kissed him passionately. I smelt his mouth for prussic acid, of which I know the smell. I did not find the smell. I turned to the fireplace to Dr. Leach, and I said, We must have a post-mortem examination. Edwin's father had his wish. The cause of death. The post-mortem results were very clear. Although mercury and lead had been found in the body, as Edwin's father had reported that his son had stated he had mercurial poisoning, they were not the cause of his death. The cause of death was due to poisoning by chloroform. With death by poison, 
This was now a case of murder. From the Penny Illustrated Paper, the 27th of February, 1886, The Pimlico Mystery. Mrs. Adelaide Bartlett, aged 30, is the centre of public interest this week. On Friday, the February the 19th, Mrs. Bartlett, recently residing at Freyan Road in Dulwich and giving an address at 66 Gresham Street in the city, was brought up at Westminster Police Court before Mr. Partridge charged upon the coroner's warrant on remand with causing the death of her husband, Edwin Thomas Bartlett, aged 40, by the willful administration of chloroform at 85 Claverton Street in Pimlico, where the deceased resided up to the time of his death on or about midnight on December the 31st, 1885. And the Reverend George Dyson, aged 27, living at 18 Parkfield Putney, a Wesleyan minister who was also placed in the dock, charged with being concerned with her in so doing, being an accessory before the fact. It will be recollected that Mrs. Bartlett was arrested after the coroner's inquiry, and on Friday the twelfth instant was formally charged at the court with the murder of the deceased. Mrs. Bartlett was attired in deep mourning, draped with crepe. Her long black hair and dark hazel eyes with lashes of the same colour. She wore a long widow's veil which she kept down and appeared to be suffering from weakness, a female being allowed to be in attendance on her. The Reverend George Dyson is a young man of medium height with dark hair, heavy moustache, close-cut whiskers and a heavy jaw, and when placed in the dock was dressed in clerical attire. Although very pale, he appeared composed. When the coroner's jury on the previous day decided that, in their opinion, Edwin Thomas Bartlett died from the effects of chloroform administered to him by his wife for the purpose of taking his life, and that the Reverend George Dyson was an accessory before the fact the young minister was greatly affected. The coroner said this was a verdict of willful murder against both Mrs. Bartlett and Mr. Dyson. The jury said they desired a presentment to be made to the proper authorities, expressing their opinion that chloroform and other poisons equally dangerous should be sold under greater restrictions. The coroner said he agreed with the recommendation and would forward it to the proper quarter. A painful scene took place in the crowded court on the verdict being delivered. The Reverend George Dyson sank into his chair, almost fainting, and cried. His Wesleyan friends, particularly several ministers, standing around him in a sympathetic manner. After the lapse of a few minutes, Mr. Dyson became calmer, and he was taken into custody to Rochester Row Police Station, to which he was accompanied by his brother and another clergyman. Additional evidence regarding the special relationship between Adelaide and Mr. Dyson came from the landlord and the servants and consisted of Mr. Dyson being known to often visit Mrs. Adelaide Bartlett when her husband was away. From the Penny Illustrated Paper on the 9th of April, the maid Alice deposed. I have known Mr. Dyson to come as early as a quarter past nine o'clock in the morning. At that time, Mr. Bartlett had gone to business. Mr. Bartlett used to return about six o'clock in the evening. Mr. Dyson had sometimes remained to dinner and had dined with Mr. and Mrs. Bartlett. Mr. Dyson used to keep his old coat and slippers in the house. Sometimes, while Mr. Dyson and Mrs. Bartlett were together in the room, I have seen the window curtains pulled together and pinned. I have seen them sitting on the sofa together, and I have seen them sitting on the floor together. I have seen Mrs. Bartlett sitting 
on the floor with her head on Mr. Dyson's knee. The trial. The trial was the trial of the year, and was splashed across the papers in lurid detail. From the Penny Illustrated Paper, the 9th of April, the Pimlico Mystery, the Reverend G. Dyson dismissed Mrs. Bartlett's trial. The indictment first charged Mrs. Bartlett and the Reverend George Dyson with the willful murder of Mr. Bartlett by the administration of chloroform, the Reverend gentleman being charged as an accessory before the fact. After a brief interval came Mrs. Bartlett, conducted by two female warders. The prisoners were placed wide apart, almost at the extremities of the front, the woman to the left, the man to the right, facing the judge. Both looked very ill. Mrs. Bartlett's eyes were drooping, and she stood motionless, with arms straight down the sides. A small figure, wearing a well-fitting black silk dress, relieved by something white at the neck, and conspicuous by the great shock of short black hair surmounting a somewhat broad and sallow face. Her appearance as she now stood, and therefore when she sat, was ever the same, that of a person stupefied by grief or pain, and only half conscious of what was going on around. Mr. Dyson looked at the bench and at the jury, grave and sorrowful, but keenly on the alert. Mrs. Bartlett's lips simply moved in reply to the routine question but no sound was heard, while Mr. Dyson's not guilty, on the contrary, was distinctly audible. After this formality, Mrs. Bartlett, hitherto downcast eyes, seemed to be closed, and so she remained, her head on one side, and apparently heeding nothing. Mr. Dyson scrutinised the jury as they were sworn, though it speedily turned out he had no reason to be anxious respecting them on his own account. He was formally found not guilty and discharged, but his companion, Mrs. Bartlett, apparently did not observe that he was a free man. Based on the circumstantial evidence, it would seem to be an easy case of guilt. However, although there was considerable chloroform in Edwin's stomach, and the medical evidence testified that this was the cause of his death, there was no evidence as to how the chloroform got into his stomach. Had Edwin swallowed the chloroform, traces of the burning would have been apparent in his throat, but there was no trace whatsoever. From the Penny Illustrated Paper, the 19th of April, 1886, the case of Adelaide Bartlett, trial acquittal. The result of the trial of Mrs. Bartlett was given in the Times Cable News yesterday. The jury acquitted her after being out only a short time, and the verdict was applauded by the spectators. Testimony for the defence showed that Mrs. Bartlett retained the chloroform bottle for a long time after her husband's death, and that she had been extremely anxious for a post mortem examination in order to ascertain the exact cause of death. Another point that weighed heavily by the jury was made by the judge in his summing up. He said that Mr. Dyson had taken advantage of the husband's peculiar state of mind to supplant him in the affections of Mrs. Bartlett, and he advised that no part of that gentleman's testimony to be trustworthy. From the London Echo, the 19th of April, 1886. Acquitted. After a trial which lasted a whole week, Adeline Bartlett has been acquitted of the murder of her husband, though the jury added that somewhat unusual statement that they thought there was great suspicion attached to the prisoner, Adelaide Bartlett. The verdict will be generally endorsed by public opinion. No doubt the statement was agreed upon in order to satisfy some of the jurymen 
who believed in the prisoner's guilt, but it is an unwelcome departure from the usual practice of juries, and in the innovation is to be depreciated. As it is, Adelaide Bartlett leaves the court with something worse than a Scotch verdict of not proven. That Edwin Bartlett died from the internal administration of chloroform is certain, but while it is possible that it was intentionally administered to him by another, it is also possible that he took it intending to commit suicide, or that he took it accidentally, without intending to take away his own life. The glass in which the chloroform had been poured was not rinsed out. From the first, she was anxious that there should be an immediate post-mortem examination of the body. When Dyson became alarmed and spoke about the chloroform, she retorted, Don't mince matters. Say that I gave it to him. Moreover, it was shown that it was almost impossible to administer chloroform internally to a man who was already under the influence of the drug. It is decidedly in Mrs. Bartlett's favour that she knew that she was being watched by a father-in-law who detested her, and that, with the full knowledge, she challenged investigation and endeavoured to hasten it forward. This woman knew quite enough about poisons to be aware that the earlier the post-mortem, the easier it would be to detect the presence of drugs. We do not doubt the public opinion will pronounce a verdict of not guilty with a firmer voice than that of the jury. A woman with no friends of her own sex, and brought into close contact with such men as the Bartlett's and the Reverend George Dyson, cannot but command general pity. It would be difficult to find three sorrier specimens of human selfishness, the sordid suspicious father, the husband who was not a husband, and the lover who was not a lover. Such a trio we should hope seldom to come into conjunction. As for Adelaide and the Reverend Mr. Dyson, both vanished from view. Rumours circulated of Adelaide having escaped to America where she died of old age, but these are unsubstantiated. Other rumours circulated that Adelaide and the Reverend George Dyson had restored their previous relation to an unknown location, possibly Australia, but again, these rumours were unsubstantiated. Did she? or didn't she? The case became an enduring medical mystery. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Firsts in Murder. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.